Hello, everybody. Josh Neighbors here, Locked On Big 12 Podcast. Joining us today from the Tulsa world, uh, our friend Eli Letterman, who is now covering both Oklahoma and Oklahoma State. So good Oklahoma perspective coming. We're going to talk about the vaunted FPI rankings that have just come out right now. It's got everybody talking. Uh, we'll talk about those and also the outlooks for both Oklahoma and Oklahoma State in football as we head towards 2022. That's coming up after our intro video. You are Locked On Big 12, your daily podcast on the Big 12 Conference, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Once again, folks, Josh Neighbors here joining us. It is Eli Letterman of the Tulsa World. So, Eli, you know, you talked to us last time covering Oklahoma State. You are still with the Tulsa World, but you're transitioning over from covering Oklahoma State stuff to now Oklahoma stuff. So tell us about uh, your transition and kind of what people can expect coming up from you. Yeah, it's exciting stuff. I'm In the summer, I'll be full-time moving over to, to covering the Sooners, but I've Spent most of spring camp already down in Norman around Brent Venables and, and all that's new there. Uh, but if anyone has the recall from last time, I'm still coming to you from my office in Stillwater. Mm -hmm. And I'm still doing plenty here around OSU, at least for the next couple months. Um, and the cool part there, it's, I mean, it's a bit of a double-edged sword, but I'm really getting to see both sides of the Bedlam, Bedlam rivalry. And uh, as a reporter covering both teams with followers from both teams, uh, especially on Twitter, as we all know, such a friendly place. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm certainly really feeling both sides of that rivalry. So it's all been good. It's exciting stuff. And uh, I can say, I mean, the cool thing for any football fan in Oklahoma, there's really good stuff going on in Stillwater and really exciting stuff happening in Norman. Mm -hmm. um, it's about as good a time, I think, where maybe the two schools have been in a little while. So have you gotten, have you been called like a traitor yet? Has, has anybody been like this guy, Eli? Just we thought he was, he, th he thought he was a, a cowboy and he's going to go be a sooner. So I'm a trader on the Oklahoma State end, but then when I tweet out, like today, tweet out a softball story on Oklahoma State, the Sooner fans come after me. So I really can't win. And, and once you accept that, it's all. Are people actually coming after you, though? Are they like, you know, is yeah, it a little bit here and there, like, yeah. mostly tongue in cheek. A lot of my yeah. uh, really it's, it's a lot of the people who I grew to enjoy as followers and readers when I was on the yeah. OSU beat who are just, you know, I, I, maybe they aren't bummed to see me go. Uh, but uh it's all mostly good hearted, yeah. kind hearted, but it's definitely seeing all the rivalry. So it's good you get that get that perspective for us. Uh, I am going to uh, share the screen here of mine. Football power index. It's out. You can see oh, this, boy. correct? So make sure you can see it, right? I can see it. All right. So um I've yet to get a really good explanation of how the football power index works. Do you have one? Because I, I think it's just like so it's just projections and um Bill Connolly runs his own projections. Guys like Bud Elliott run their own projections. Um, how public they make them is sometimes different. But this is really like just this is the projection for uh, where these teams are to start off, what their win total is going to be, their chances to win their conference, their division if they are in one, uh, make the playoff, all those kinds of things. So the first thing that everybody's attention gets drawn to, and I'm not I'm like, this is actually the first thing, like not Alabama being number one. It is literally the first thing you're drawn attention to is Texas, Texas at being that high. Yeah. It's Texas at number six. So uh, it, it got a lot of laughs. Uh, I, I'll be, I'll be very clear. It got, it got a lot of laughs. I'll, I'll show it again in a second. Um, but I think there is Texas had one hell of a week, right? So with yeah. the, with the Ajovo comments going on there, um, and how good sounds like when you were just doing, and now the FPI, I'm sure Sark is like, oh my God, just like, can we just do the football thing? That's all I want to do. <laughs> but I think there's something to be said about the level of talent that Texas has. Now, this is something that we've heard before, right? but, but to get, to give us kind of the Oklahoma perspective, I'm sure you've heard fans from both sides of this, but particularly the, uh, you know, from, from the OU perspective, a lot of a lot of probably eye rolling, right? Because we've seen this thing, we've seen this story before. Is Texas back? back. That's the question, right. as always. Um, well, I mean, on the FPI as a, as a whole, I think it's a brilliant piece of spring fodder. We need something right. like what beyond spring football, and even spring football kind of has its mundanities and monotony. So we need something, and this is what what does it. I don't know what FPI really is. Um, I credit you know whoever puts this together, guys like Bill Connolly, the people that spend time 
crunching numbers and doing this, if, if for nothing else, to give us something to talk about this time of year. Uh, but Texas is obviously what stuck out because once again, it's it it's Texas at the top of a preseason ranking, some form of preseason ranking, with nothing really to show for it other than a bunch of key additions. And they've done that. Um, I I think there's every reason to be optimistic and say this is the year that it could be different. There's a lot of reasons for that. And then on the flip side of it, you look at something like this week where they they just have a, a knack for making something out of nothing. Um, you know, a defensive lineman makes some comments about, you know, essentially just saying we need people in here who are focused about winning. And somehow that's a controversy. I didn't know right. that that was going to be a controversial statement. So in some ways, it's just Texas as usual. And we will see if it remains that way into the fall. Uh, what, what's striking is that you've got Texas here at the very top and you've got Kansas at the very bottom. And, and we all know how it went the last time they played. So Ironic, man, if, it, if, uh, if the Jayhawks didn't have a chip on their shoulder, I'm sure they do after reading the FBI this morning. Yeah, they're like, come on, why why do we not get the, the transitive top ten after the win <laughs> over Texas? Um, you know, it, it's you're spot on with the, with everything that's happening for them right now. It's it's always a story. I I want to I want to now move this over to quick a conversation about Oklahoma, and uh, I'll show them the FBI here and as as you answer this question, but. You know, the odds aren't out yet, and the movement's not done for players. That's the reason why the odds are not out yet for who will win the Big 12. I would venture to say that the odds on favorite to win the Big 12 next year is, well, it might be Texas because we know lines are set to get action. But if you were setting the lines, would you select the Sooners? I would. I would put them as the odds on favorite to win the Big 12 next year. What do you think? That's tough. And I guess to close out my point on the FPI is like as many questions as we have about Texas, we can have about. Oklahoma and Oklahoma state and Baylor. I don't think there's anyone returning who is like totally settled. And so that's why number eight, number eight right there in the FBI for using this. So just two spots lower than Mm -hmm. Texas. So, you know, it's not like they're being completely slighted. And so whether we're talking FPI or we're talking preseason odds and and what's going to come out of Vegas, I don't think there is a team just for, as a starting point that is like settled. We know everything about them and what they're going to bring. And so there is no, uh, to me, like a clear cut favorite. I think the Sooners have a lot to be excited about. I think, in terms of bringing in a quarterback that was going to replace Caleb Williams, bringing in someone as experienced as Dylan Gabriel mm-hmm. is and, and who has played under Jeff Levy before, like that checks two boxes of, of kind of two things you don't have to worry about. If they'd brought in someone with less experience and someone who was not, you know, inherently compatible with the offensive coordinator, you'd have your questions there. I think at, at least in that front and, and what we've heard about Dylan Gabriel so far in Norman um, has, has to have sooner fans stoked. I mean, what, what that's going to be when he gets on the field, who knows, but I do think Oklahoma has a lot in place and a lot of that, you know, positive first year energy. Obviously you hear a lot about it in the spring. It's really easy to be excited at this time of year, Um, but there's there's plenty to be excited about there. And as you look at Oklahoma state and you wonder, do they have the same defense as they did a year ago? Uh, Or number 13 close to that level. Uh, And then Texas being the question mark it is, and same for Baylor and and wondering, I think their defense is going to be pretty strong again, but what does their offense look like? Can they replicate it? I think Oklahoma is as, as good a bet as anybody. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm going to ask you right here about, about Dylan Gabriel. We just got the news of D, JT Daniels going to West Virginia. Think across the board of all the big 12 quarterbacks. Is Dylan Gabriel the best big 12 quarterback as we head into the 2022 football season? I think I'd have to give that nod to Spencer Sanders. Oh, really? Yes. I, you wow. know, man. Uh, and it's tough. I watched him all last year. We know his. We knew his history going into last year, and yeah. at times we still saw some of that inconsistency. But I'll, I guess I'll put it this way: when playing at their very best, I don't know the last. I mean, Spencer Sanders in that Fiesta Bowl against Notre Dame was off the charts. I mean, he was playing at uh, at the Arizona Cardinal Stadium, and at times the way his feet were moving, you thought you were watching Kyler Murray. Now, Spencer Sanders did that pretty much once last year. He was he was markedly better. Um, and really outside of the two Baylor games, uh, he, he really was that guy who was a lot more consistent, didn't turn the ball over the same way, but, um, you know, he was not the guy he was in the Fiesta Bowl for 13 games. I, I do think given that Dylan Gabriel hasn't played in this conference yet, I give the nod to Spencer Sanders, mm. but Dylan Gabriel, the lefty in a system he knows with Jeff Levy, right. I think has every chance to, to be that guy. It's, I was, I was, I'm I shocked. surprised you there. I surprised I, you really you did there. shock me because, because so you and I talked last time. So you, <laughs> you know, I'm a huge Spencer Sanders guy. Like yeah. I really, 
you know, I, I was I was thinking about this before you and I were talking today about, you know, the, the ways that we frame certain stuff. Like the ma- most talented quarterback in the conference, I mean, if you want to go from an actual like talent perspective, it'd probably be Quinn Ewers, right? That's probably the guy with the most talent. And honestly, yeah. if you want to go second, JT Daniels, lest we forget, was a five star, right? This is mm-hmm. a guy who's a five star now. Is that talent level, you know, um, is that who he is now after all the injuries? Probably not, right? It's probably not where he is, but still probably a pretty good player if he can be, you know, part of that good. Spencer Sanders, you and I have talked about, like, it looks like, you know, uh, you mentioned the Kyler Murray stuff. It's like on the run, ripping throws, but then there's just the, you know, the head scratching um, decision making. I-, I guess with Dylan Gabriel, the J- the Jeff Levy part of it is the part that I think has has me leaning that way, right? And Levy is being very well compensated, and rightfully so, because of the kind of coordinator that he is. Um, are you expecting to see and, and you know kind of help the folks who don't know? Like, yeah, what are what do you expect to see from a Jeff Levy offense? Because it is this is now it's not going to be unfamiliar to Big Twelve fans, right? We we've seen this offense uh, many times before. It is Art Bryles' offense. So, what are they going to see? Do you think Oklahoma uh, is going to be you know a lot of what we saw from Matt Corral last year? It's going to be really fast. It's going to be a fast moving offense. I mean, what we heard from all the guys in Norman, from the offensive linemen to, you know, from Dylan Gabriel, the wide receivers, down to the defenders who have to work against this offense, just how fast they're moving. And that the, the goal is going to be to wear defenses down and kind of catch them off guard. And off the bat, that sounds pretty good. I mean, I, I think people can really get on board with the tempo offense. Uh, we had, it was either Anton Harrison or Chris Murray, one of the two offensive linemen yesterday said, you know, the goal like straight from the mouth of Jeff Levy has dropped 60 on him every week. And I think sooner mm-hmm. fans can get on board with that if, if that's the, the reality. Uh, but it's going to be fast moving. It's going to be, uh, I, I think they, they're they going to run the ball and run it, or at least attempt to run it, you know, heavily physically. Do they have right. the running backs to do that? I think is actually probably one of the biggest questions about this team. If they've got a Kennedy Brooks sized hole to fill uh, mm-hmm. and talent, but unproven talent to fill it between Eric Gray Marcus Major, they're pretty excited about Javante Barnes, the, the freshman who's on campus this spring. Um, but if you're going to run the ball and you don't have a proven ball carrier, it's at least something to, to wonder about going into the fall. Uh, but it, it's going to be a fast-moving offense. It, it should resemble probably what people saw at Ole Miss, what people saw at UCF, and and be some form of evolution of that. But uh, it, it's going to be high-flying. It's going to be fast. So last year, I, I think you brought up a great point with the running because I think people think Matt Corral slinging it around, right? And you watch you watch Ole Miss last year. That team's bread and butter was running the football. That that's really what they wanted. To, and even with Matt Corral, um, I don't think I, I think for a couple of reasons. Number one, Dylan Gabriel's coming off the injury. He can run. He's a pretty good runner. I don't think we're going to see him run as much. And two, I think we saw last year, Matt Corral took a pretty good beating. Now, some of that was his own decision-making. It's not always Mm -hmm. designed. I mean, he called his number a lot. But, like, that Tennessee game, he took took a really pretty, I mean, considerable beating in that game. Um, Do you – what do you think they do to kind of maybe go away from that element to to bring something else as opposed to using the quarterback to run? What do you think they do? Or do you think it's just use more of the other stuff in the offense? Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be a real question. I'd like to see Dylan Gabriel come early September and what he looks like as a runner uh, in this offense. But you're right, between the injuries coming back from and the fact that we saw a cra- almost a crash test dummy of Matt Corral last year in, in a Jeff yeah. Levy offense of, of what it can look like. And as you said, some of that's on Matt Corral, but you know, these are not the defenses of old in the Big 12. If you're leaving your quarterback vulnerable, he's going to take some shots. Spencer Sanders has taken some shots and he's Mm -hmm. almost, I mean, he's missed games at times, but he's pretty durable. He can take those hits, but the hits are there. If you're going to put your quarterback, you know, beyond the line of scrimmage and have him running, he's going to get hit. And so you really have to consider that particularly because there's no Caleb Williams sitting behind your starter this year. Um, There's nobody, the the two deep looks a little different at quarterback this year. And I don't think this team, I think that ceiling really changes if Dylan Gabriel is not under center. So it's compensating in other ways. I think they have a really interesting group of running backs. I mean, Eric Gray is going to be a physical guy. He's a veteran, the most experienced of them. But behind him, like Marcus Majors, funny, he's it's his fourth year in Norman. He's carried 60 times. Right. And DeMarco right. Murray was talking about it yesterday, that it's, it's kind of like having up here 
at, in his head, he, he's he's a veteran, but he's got some pretty you know fresh tires, as he put it. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, what can he be? What can uh, Javante Barnes or Gavin Sokchuk, the two freshmen, can he get something from either of them? Or, you know, as you alluded to before, there could be more movement afoot. And I don't know that that's their top priority, but is another running back getting in there and, and finding different ways to deploy those guys? Um, you know, getting creative with the offense to to get the ball in the hands of speedy guys and, and make it so that your quarterback doesn't have to be the one, you know, breaking off runs and, and potentially taking hits. All right, we're going to talk Oklahoma State here in one second. Quick word from our sponsors, though. Today's show is brought to you by Built Bar. Go to built.com today. That's built.com. Use promo code LOCK15, L-O-C-K-E-D-1-5, LOCK15. Built Bars have 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, 4 net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. Uh, it's better for you than a candy bar. It tastes just as good as a candy bar. They got different flavors: mint brownie, coconut, coconut almond, and white chocolate cookies and cream. So check all of that out today. Promo code LOCKED15, 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 LOCKED15 15 L O C K E D one five locked fifteen at built dot com today. All right, so Oklahoma State checks in at number thirteen in the FPI. Uh, once again, I'm not going to claim to know how this any of this works. Um, I'm just going to say it's you know that they <laughs> they account for recruiting rankings, returning production schedule, all of those things. They're like. That makes sense. Um, this is a predictive model, by the way, too. I think that's kind of like, that's the one thing, folks. And like, this is a predictive model, I think, is the is the big way to look at this. Somebody might come and be like, Josh, you idiot, it's not. But I mean, at least the way I'm understanding it, if they're projecting win totals right next to the team's ranking, I, I, th- I think that's kind of what we're trying to do here. Um, they, this season, think need to make sure they figure out a way on offense to split up that running back load because last year I would, you know, you think really, you really could argue it, it did cost him in the end. Jalen Warren was banged up at the end and really we didn't see him. And um, that offense was so reliant on playing defense and running the football. It's, it's the age old conversation over the last four years. It's time for more responsibility to be shifted to the passing game. Yeah. And to, you know, Spencer Sanders, right. Is that kind of what we're, where we're at with the offense? I think so. Well, some of it's just by necessity. If they had Jalen Warren coming back, it would be a different conversation, but they don't. Right. And they don't have, LD Brown or Desmond Jackson back. I mean, Desmond Jackson will probably be remembered for really his final moment in an Oklahoma State uniform was coming up just a few inches short. Uh, and I don't know. I, I mean, we, we, we can relitigate that play for the next, you know, 30 years. I, I don't know what more he could have done there other than, you know, not leaving until the end what Oklahoma State could have done more to, to make that comeback. That that was almost their greatest one until the Fiesta Bowl. Uh, but that's between LD Brown, Jalen Warren, and Desmond Jackson. That's 80% of the carries from last year. And so, and and the other, a bulk of those others, you know, were Dominic Richardson. He's going to be the guy now who has to prove he can do it with a greater workload. But like you said, even if he is that guy, if he emerges as a thousand r- yard rusher, you can't just run him into the ground and, or, or it's going to look like it did for Oklahoma State at the end of last season. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's Jaden Nixon who showed some flashes last year. I mean, he, he's fast. And, and that, that will give them at least a different dimension. Dominic Richardson's a physical guy, more speed back in Jaden Nixon. And then the guy everybody's real excited about here is Ollie Gordon, who's the, the freshman who doesn't look anything like a freshman. Hardly <laughs> looks like a running back. He's, he's big. He's big. He's six foot three, something like 220 pounds. So he's kind of already got that body and looks like a guy who can, I might be wrong in that 220 stat. Don't quote me there. But he, I, if, if he isn't 220 yet, Mike Gundy said on signing day that that's where he'd like him to be eventually. Mm. And so they project him as a big physical back as well. And so it's a little bit like Oklahoma, a lot of unknowns, but guys to be excited about different kinds of running backs that if, if I mean, same with Jeff Levy, if Casey Dunn can get creative with them in the passing game or where he deploys them, the, the potential's there, but you're not coming in with a guy that you know you can hand the ball to, uh, you know, 15, 20 times a game and and get results from. And so that's for both schools, one of probably many question marks. Well, it's so funny because what we're talking and, and I'm going to mention Baylor here in a second, because they're also top 25. Like are all of our questions are like, all right, who's coming in at running back in the big yeah. 12? They forget the quarterbacks, like who's playing running back. I think there's something to your point about um, last year. There was no flash in Oklahoma state's running game. And you and I mentioned this too before, Mike Gundy's ability to adapt, uh, you know, on the football field, I think is a quality that, you know, I not getting talked about enough because he's so thought of for offense. And he thought, no, I'm going to play to my team's strengths. It's running the football and playing defense. Yeah. And this year, the idea that they have got more than one way maybe to run the football, right. As opposed and Jalen Warren was very much right at you, right. That was, 
that was kind of how it was done. You know, high carry load, wear you down. And he did a very good job of that last year. Uh, more substance, you know, in, in terms of, the, I, I will say this, you lose a guy um, for Jim Knowles on as defensive coordinator. Like you can't do much better than getting Derek Mason in. I mean, you can't, no, you literally was, cannot do much better than do, getting Derek Mason. In. I'll say this. If, if Mike Gundy could have hit a home run, that, that was it. It was getting yeah. an SEC coordinator. He got some help from Brian Harson and all of this function. Yeah, Auburn. shout out to Brian Harson. Um, <laughs> Mike Gundy might owe Brian Harson a drink or something the next yes. time. They're all, wherever the, all the coaches. I think those guys there. actually probably have more in common than we think, right? They, probably uh, they so. Might be more politically. But, uh, you know, with, with Derek Mason coming in, it, it, certainly brings some solidity to the defense, but there's no getting around the fact of, of what this defense lost. I mean, Malcolm Rodriguez and Devin Harper, we knew how good Malcolm Rodriguez was. I don't think people appreciated how good Devin Harper was next to him, but right. those two guys at, at linebacker in, in between behind an, a defensive line that was as good as any in the country and in front of a, a secondary that really had some playmakers in it, they were the core of the defense. Those two are gone. Secondary, you lose a bunch of guys, Trace Sterling, Colby Harvell, Peel. Uh, mm-hmm. I think the the real surprise from that group is Jar Bernard Converse hitting the portal and going to LSU. You'd right. probably be feeling a little bit better about it about the secondary if you had him coming back. So personnel wise, it, it's really changed. Up front, they're still going to be terrifying. You've got Brock Martin, you've got Colin Oliver, Trace Ford, and, and Tyler Lacey. Like yeah, adding Trace Ford to a, a D line that that led the Big Twelve and and almost led the nation in sacks. Hard to and, argue with that. And we know about this. You know, one thing that the good defensive lines can do, they can mask a whole lot of other problems. That they can. Them, right? But so that's a big advantage. You know, you talk about that balance of Gundy adjusting. And last year it was going away from a very traditional Oklahoma State offense, a run and gun, put it up 55 points, to we're going to run the ball, we're going to control the football, and our defense is going to is going to do it for us. So they kind of went from here to here. I mm. think they got to find somewhere in the middle this year and leaning more on the passing game, because while there are those options at running back, none of them – I mean, if Dominic Richardson is a guy who's really just been a feature back at points, is your most proven guy, there's questions to be asked. And so while the passing game doesn't really have a, a number one, I don't know, think – the, the guy you'd think of here, Tylen Wallace, what Tay Martin was a year ago, going all the way back to, to Des Bryant, they, there may not be that guy off the bat. It would probably be Jaden Bray if anybody, but he, you know, he's entering year two. There's just so much talent in that receiving core, and you've got Spencer Sanders that you'd have to think with Brennan Presley and, and all those guys who showed flashes last year that the passing game is where they have to look, and they probably do have to score a bit more. They, I don't think they're going to have a defense that uh, can can support them the way last year's did, and, and so we'll see if they can find that balance. So I know you don't cover Baylor, but I just want to ask you about Baylor because it's going to lead into another question that I have. Mm-hmm. Um, starting to feel like, you know, I know it's only one year of a lot of success, but – Dave Aranda just like the light, you could just clearly clicked, right? It clicked um, it from, from, you know, making those second hires, right? Especially on the offensive side and just recognizing, Hey, the Larry Fedora thing did not work. Okay. Let's go grab the BYU guys, both yeah. Mateos uh, and then totally blank, you know, Jeff Grimes, right? Offensive line looks really good. And it just, it, it's it making me think about the number of good coaches that are in this conference this year. Uh, and, you know, that are going to be down the road, too, especially when you add a Kalani Sataki. Uh, you know, you're going to add Dana Holgerson, who's, you know, they want to keep him at Houston very badly. Yep. Uh, you know, you're going to add Luke Fickle, looks like at this point, you know, unless something happens, which obviously it could. There's still some time. But, you know, th- I mean, Baylor to me is a team that I think it's Texas and Oklahoma just because the talent level. And also, I really think Brett Metals can do a great job. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think Baylor and Oklahoma State are going to be right there. And I think I think one of those two teams is going to end up really disappointed with like an eight and four or seven and five this year, and maybe rightfully so. But I think it's just kind of how the, the cookie's going to crumble in this conference. Yeah, I mean, if you go to last year's Big Twelve title game, you had Baylor and Oklahoma State, really in some ways analogous teams. Uh, their defenses mm-hmm. were so so good. Offenses had question marks, although I, I think Spencer Sanders deserves a little more. You know, get. Gets a little more in his favor than, than that. It was Blake Shapin that day, and there's Gary Bohan. And the quarterback situation at Baylor is probably the biggest thing for them to figure out. But now we go, you know, fast forward a year into next season. Baylor's defense is going to resemble they, – they lost pieces, but is going to look a lot alike. I don't know if the same can be said for Oklahoma State. And so if we're sitting here right now in April, you might look at that as a difference between those two teams. And if one of them is going to, 
you know, push at the top of the Big 12 and another, as you're kind of laying out, is going to maybe be disappointed. That that could be a difference maker is that Oklahoma State's defense is not going to be what it was. And, and Baylor's may be able to, to resemble that that Big 12 title winning defense a right. bit more. But, you know, look at the FPI here again, the, the trusty FPI. I think they've got it mostly right. I'm, let's sort of remove the t- where Texas is at from the equation. Th- those are your four top teams yeah. in some order. It, it's Texas. It's it's Oklahoma, it's Oklahoma State and Baylor, and each of them has has things that none of us know about that that we're gonna want right. to get answers to. But th- that's the top four. And remove the remove the rankings for a second. Like listen to the projected win totals for Texas nine nine point four wins. Yep. Oklahoma nine point one. Oklahoma State eight point five. Uh, Baylor seven point nine. All right. So like you know when we're talking about. Um, this as not a attach a number. Where are we ranked? Look at the actual substance here. And I'm, I'm defending the FBI now. Look at the substance. Like that does not uh, for Oklahoma. I actually think it's a little low. I think mm-hmm. Oklahoma's. I think Oklahoma's schedule is really good this year. I think it's a great schedule for them. I think it's. A, I mean, I, they're probably going to be favored maybe in every game unless Texas gets off to like a really hot start. I mean, I don't see a game where OU is not going to be favored. But these look right. Like th- this is why I was. You know, I just made the point to you. Like either Baylor or Oklahoma State might end up with a disappointing seven and five and eight and four. Although that's kind of where the projections show they should be at, but the expectations have changed. And I I think that they should, which gets me to my final question for you, Eli. And I, I was talking about this in the podcast yesterday. It's really interesting. Um, is is the new Big Twelve to you still going to be a Power Five conference? Because I think the idea that the brands might not be, but the quality of the football is. Because, like, the Pac-12 right now is propped up by Lincoln Riley, who's not coached a game yet at USC, and Phil Knight at Oregon. And we'd have no idea what Dan Lanning is going to look like there. And also maybe Chip Kelly. But, like, that's not been an incredible operation so far. Uh, You know, it's good, but not, like, excellent. And then the ACC is a one-team league. And, look, they just just got their, you know, their coach poached. So, um, excuse me, coach is. Their their coordinator is poached. So, my question to you is, do you think this league is going to be closer to the AAC or to the ACC and the Pac-12 when the movement comes, when the, when OU and Texas leave? I've got faith that the Big 12 is going to be fine. We don't know what the landscape of college football will look like, whether we're going to go to, you know, in five years, we might be looking at four 16-team divisions or whatever. Like, let's take that out of it and assume some form of, of playoff expansion. I think you know, a school like Oklahoma state has every opportunity and it's what Mike Gundy has pressed uh, on the administration to do. And it's what it sounds like they're starting to do, which was we got to build on last season and build on a Fiesta Bowl win over Notre Dame, because when OU and Texas are gone, what, what's keeping Oklahoma state from becoming the class of this conference. And, and then you've got teams like Cincinnati and BYU Houston. If there's 12 playoff teams, why can't there be, you know, two or even three from the big 12. And I, and that's where I think, you know, it's on that depth. They're going to lose. You, you can't understate losing Texas and OU from a brand perspective and all that. But, you know, this past year, if you looked at it, you would have had of the remaining Big 12 teams and the ones coming in, you'd have had at least four or five contending in an expanded playoff scenario. Uh, and and I think that's what's got to give people some faith is that these programs, uh, if they're well supported and supported by the conference and the conference can market itself well, if, if two or three of them can can pull off playoff contention every year, I I mean, I, in some ways it's better than what the Big 12 is doing right now. It's a different landscape, but um, I, I think there's reason to believe that they can remain afloat. But again, the, the hit of losing your two blue bloods and, and Red River not being kind of the, the the headline rivalry or conference certainly hurts. And I don't know where those rivalries are still going to be within the conference. Right. That's fair. I, I just think from a competitive standpoint, those like it's going to be just as competitive. I mean, the Pac-12 was not. Yeah. Like BYU went five and zero against Pac-12 South, <laughs> so you know it's it's like on a on a sure from a brand's basis, there's no yeah. UCLA, USC, Oregon, Stanford. Even St- Stanford sucks, and they're like still a pretty big brand. I, for the for, you know Virginia Tech, Miami, there's no they don't have that, but they have like good teams. Is kind of is kind of the point I, I think. So I think it's a really interesting conversation. All right, uh, one more quick word from our sponsors here, Eli. Today's show is brought to you by. Bet online and betonline.net. It's the best place to get on all the sports action you could want. As the lawnmower is going very loud outside my house, uh, they have got Major League Baseball, pro basketball is in the playoffs uh, or play-in games. Excuse me, 
right now, which I count as playoff games that apparently are not counted as playoff games. <laughs> you can bet on that. You can bet on golf. You can bet on F1. You can bet on NASCAR. You can bet on UFC, boxing. They've got it all there. So go to bet online and betonline.net today. Bet online. It's where the game starts. All right, Eli, uh, where could people find you and your work and all of its variety? You can find it all still at the Tulsa World. I haven't gone anywhere, although I'm going somewhere, moving down to Norman. But <laughs> You uh, physically are going somewhere. The yes, work I am going, going somewhere. Anywhere. My work yeah. will all be in the same place. Uh, I'm working alongside the, the super talented Eric Bailey, which is, is going to make our work and our coverage of OU even better. So, I mean, you go there every day. We'll have something for you, and uh, I can tease one upcoming project. Next nice. Saturday, spring game, Baker Mayfield is having his uh, statue, Heisman statue unveiled outside and at at Heisman Park. And so we're doing a project uh, on Heisman Park. I teaser, I spoke with Barry Switzer this morning. Um, and cool. we'll have something on all the Heisman history at OU, all the way through Baker coming back at a very uninteresting time for him. I, he, he's had a boring offseason, Baker Mayfield. And so uh, it, it is <laughs> kidding. He's going to be back in Norman next weekend at a very uh, interesting time. I saw yesterday. So yeah, the podcast, right? Everybody's talking about the podcast. Yeah. I don't, I mean, all, all his options kind of dried up on him a little bit. I'm sure he's going to, I think, I mean, me personally, we're, how many months removed are we from thinking like Baker Mayfield was a guy and like a dude that the Browns like could build around? Five. I mean, the Washington football team is traded for Carson Wentz. Man, it wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't the Washington football team be way more exciting? Or I'd rather be, I'd rather be honest, as a fan, I'd rather have Baker, May, Baker Mayfield. Me too. So. Uh, oh my right. God. So would I. So I think. I think he's going to land somewhere and at least deserves a shot. He didn't do himself any yeah. favors last year playing through the no. injuries. Uh, no. But we'll see there. But he will be down in Norman. We'll have coverage of that on the day and in the lead up. Uh, tons of it. If you want to read stories about Billy Sims, Sam Bradford, Jason White, all those guys, we'll have them. All right. Eli, Eli Letterman, Tulsa World. Appreciate your time, man. Always a pleasure, man.